Welcome to the good, the bad, and the sequel Q&A. My name's Doug. So the next sequel that we're going to be covering is one that might send Jamie over the edge. His sequel watching journey, he might want to just get off that, uh, you know, get his parachute, jump off the airplane, and not have to watch anymore. But it's going to be a lot of fun. It's a full moon classic, Ginger Dead Man 3, Saturday Night Cleaver. And this week's guest, who I interviewed for it, actress Junie Hoang, she was actually in the second film, which is Passion of the Crust. So me and Jamie debated, which one should we go with? Uh, and Saturday Night Cleaver, that one has a little time traveling element. It's set in the 70s. So who doesn't love the 70s? So we went with that. So, uh, yeah, so that is going to be something to discuss. And me and Junie had a lot to discuss. Uh, we talked about our mutual love for horror. There were some parts of the interview I cut out because it has some spoilers, even though the movie Halloween ends and a few other horror movies that came out, uh, sequels that came out in recent years. We talked about them pretty much in depth, so I cut that part out of it. But uh, that was a lot of fun. I think it was almost like 20, 30 minutes of Junie and me just talking about Halloween ends and what we thought of that film. She talked about the new Exorcist movie that came out around the time that we did this interview way back at the end of 2023. Man, time does fly. But I love Junie's story. She came, she was born in Vietnam. Her family came to America, settled in, uh, in, in a part of Texas. And we just talked about her journey from the early days, we talked about a lot of reality show TV, which I think was so interesting about her career was reality shows and how they're not much reality at all. So you hear her talk about that, talk about her chance to work on full movie movies, which she absolutely loved. The difference in working on big budget movies and some of the, sometimes the hurdles that come with that versus working on more independent guerrilla filmmaking, which she prefers. It was a lot of fun. I really connected with her and it was a lot of fun talking about our passion for horror and uh, talking about, you know, the horror films that we saw at such a young age. The fact that she saw American Werewolf in uh, from American Werewolf in London in the movie theaters very young is uh, amazing and scary at the same time. Just like me seeing Nightmare on Elm Street at a very young age at five or six. It's like scary, but in a way, I'm like, it's pretty awesome that I had the balls to watch that movie at such a young age. I didn't sleep for a few days afterwards, but I think it was worth it. It really fueled my horror and movie passion because of it. So, yeah, so Junie is a lot of fun. Before I start the interview, please like, share, follow, rate, all the things you could possibly do for our podcast. Do it. And then on all social media as well, we're at sequels only. And then on YouTube, the good, the bad, and the sequel, if you can go on there, that really helps out as well. We have that. More subscribers, the merrier. And I'll put Junie's interview. It'll be unedited, so there'll be me flubbing lines. Uh, there's a little dead 20-minute space where Mike uh, dis disconnects, but who cares? I, I love the – when you watch a video that's all chopped up, taking things out, it just isn't – free flowing because you see the change in the people but if you want to watch the unedited video interview you can at sequels only.com uh it'll be up there but yeah so without further ado here is actress Junie Owen. i always like to find out like the beginnings of people so so you were born in vietnam but did you did you live there at all growing up at all before you came to the states i don't have much memory of it um yeah. i just remember Maybe four years of it because I was so young, but I'm sure if yeah. I went under hypnosis, I could probably recall <laughs> a lot more, <laughs> which might not be a good thing, but yeah, um, yeah I, I left when I was very young. Oh, wow. Okay. And where'd you guys, where'd you end up growing up? Was it in Texas? Yeah. So originally we went from Vietnam and then we, you know, we were refugees. So we went to Camp Pendleton. Um, of course, went to the Philippines and then Camp Pendleton. And we tried to live somewhere that mimicked the climate of Vietnam. And yeah. definitely, uh, it was not Terre Haute, Indiana, because <laughs> it's very <laughs> cold there. So when we went there, we said, we can't do this. It's way too cold. And we tried going to um, a place that was more tropical. Well, I don't want to say tropical because Texas is not really tropical, but it's very humid. Yeah. So we yes. settled in on Texas because it's a lot like the weather in Vietnam. It's, you know, when it gets hot, it can get over 100 degrees. 
So it, 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 it's weird. Most people say, oh, Texas is so hot, but we're used to the hot weather because we're yeah. in Vietnam. So it was just the perfect place to end up. Yeah, no, that's good. And were there other, uh, like, uh, was there like a Vietnamese community? Like where you guys ended well, up there's growing, a big like, living one in Texas? Yeah. The, when we first came here, there was a lot of um, racial tension. And, you know, we were poor, so we came here with with no money. And so we yeah. settled in kind of a bad part of town. And it was, growing up was a little bit rough because we were different, we were broke. We, um, you know, just the whole refugees coming over. So we settled in a, a, a kind of bad part of town. But eventually now, if you look back to where we, where we lived when we were kids, it's much better now. But back yeah. then it was not. No, it's got to be rough, especially in a state like texas or in the south yeah. when their yeah. views are a little bit different on people coming over but that's so great that you know it, it's definitely the land of opportunity and uh so at what age like growing up when did you think like hey i want to uh do i don't know if it was first like voice voiceover work or was it actually acting what was the first thing that really caught your eye it, it was actually uh in high school i went to a school dance and I was a I was a really weird kid because I was kind of a misfit. I was I had these really thick glasses. So thank God for LASIK. <laughs> but I had these really <laughs> thick glasses, and I was just such a big nerd. I was very awkward. I was very timid, and I I I was the type of kid that cheerleaders would make fun of because I just didn't fit. And yeah. so when I went to the school dance, it was it just clicked. I was like, hey, I'm actually pretty good at dancing. And, and that's how it all started. I, I started studying different dance forms. And it was just, a, it was the one area that I was comfortable in because everything else I was not comfortable in. Yeah. And I mean, I was comfortable doing my homework. I was comfortable being, you know, that shy kid. But it was just that one thing that just kind of pulled me out. And I felt so confident doing it. And that's how it got started. That's cool. Was there dance at school? Did you do a dance at school or like outside classes or something? Yeah, it was. Well, um, I started taking classes, but you know, as a dancer, I started really late because I kind of picked up on it when I was about 16, which is really late. Um, yeah, no, I know. Because you have to kind of form your bones and you have to really start when you're young. And, and I didn't. And plus, I'm short. So I had that going against me. Um, yeah. I'm directionally dyslexic. So when I'm doing stage left or stage right, or I, 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 it's hard for me to have spatial orientation. So it yeah, eventually it was my first love, but it didn't work out. Too many things were yeah, working. But it, but it showed you at least that, hey, there's something you could do that's in the arts. Yeah, yeah. It segued into acting, and, and I was not comfortable because I was comfortable – doing dance even though i wasn't great at it i thought i was great at it but maybe yeah. other people might not but um <laughs> eventually i went into acting and and it's weird if, if you do something long enough you get better at it so my comfort zone was dancing and then when i moved out of that zone i was like oh acting that's gonna be just a whole different arena i was not i was nervous and then eventually when i did it for a while i was like hey now this is my new comfort zone so it's, it's funny how we can adapt to new, yeah. new environments, yeah. What was your first step into acting? Was it like stage or did you just take some cla like acting classes? I did a play um, because I was still very, I had, a, I had a really bad case of stage fright. So I wasn't good talking in front of people and I, I still am not, but I've just learned to hide it better as I got older. But yeah. um, I had a really bad case of stage fright. So the first play that I did was a play that was put on. It was a musical dance. It was the Texas Mime Theater. So it was mimes and dancing, Koumba House, which was African dancing. So, okay. um, and there was no dialogue. We had to pretty much invent our own language. So I was like, oh, this is great. I don't have lines to yeah. forget. <laughs> I just improv, <laughs> you know, this fake language that we had to create for our characters. But um, yeah, it's it's it was the first time I did live theater, and it was it was incredible. Yeah, and like the friend, rush you friend. get, you know, the rush from being on stage and yeah. people clapping because like all eyes are on you. It's like this weird, powerful thing. Like you can give a speech or 
uh, at a wedding or a eulogy at a funeral, but like being on a stage, I've only done it like a few times doing like improv, but it's kind of like this weird thing. It's like you feel all the eyes on you. And like you said, with stage fright, because I had stage fright early on. And then I was like, wow, this is like wild. Like everybody's yeah. watching it's every like an adrenaline rush. Thing. Oh, yeah. 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 There's nothing like it. Um, I'm still not comfortable doing stage, but I was comfortable doing that because like I said, there was no lines to forget. It was all made up lines yeah. and there was dancing involved. So I was like, oh, back to my roots. So it just it was just such a perfect click. And the weird thing is uh, they cast me as one of the leads. And it's so strange. But there was an actor who was in that play. And he happened to be a classmate of my sister's. So... And now she still talks to him. And we just found out that it's like, oh, that's my sister. Oh, hey, I went to school with her. And it was just it was just kind of the universe just going, hey, here I come again. I'm back around. So it was just so yeah. odd. To remember that. Yeah, you get to remember that story. And then somebody else is that, that was involved with it. That's pretty cool. So yeah. what was the next step after that? Was it like, were you taking classes or did you go to school for it? Yeah, I so I left dancing. Uh, when I got to my mid twenties, I said this isn't going to work for dancing. There was, <laughs> can you believe, I said there was too much rejection. I was like, oh well, I haven't seen anything yet, <laughs> yeah. because then you really get rejected when you go into acting. So I said, let me try doing independent films, and and I booked my first independent film uh, back in the mid nineties, and it was so weird because it was the first job I booked and. Uh, and I got it. I, I was cast, and then I was uncast uh, because they found someone they liked better. And then it ended up she turned it down. So then they came back to me and said, "Hey." So I was like, "Hey, I'm kind of chopped liver." You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, it yeah. My, it was my first job, but I I got it because the person who they really wanted didn't want to do it. So then they came back and, and cast me for it. So it was a, kind of a little bit of a bittersweet uh <laughs> bittersweet experience <laughs> but you got oh, it was that Ushio, was that ushio and tora was that no 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 that first... was uh, uh ushio and tora was an anime that i did i used to do a lot of oh, voiceover okay. animes i know i saw that on there that's pretty wild yeah I, I did a ton of voiceover animes but the film that i did it, it's so weird it was called fifth ward and it was an independent film that was on bet um, oh, okay i see it on here yeah one of those um, independent films. And the weird thing was 20 years later, they turned it into a, a streaming TV series. So then they called me back 20 years later. I was playing the little girl, the daughter in the film. And then I came back 20 years later and played the mom to the little girl that I played 20 years ago. So, That's awesome. Luckily they, they Is that the one with Maya? Is that the one that Maya's in it? Maya, yes. That's really cool. Because I saw you're a producer yeah. on that too. They give you a producing yeah. credit? That's awesome. They gave me a producing credit because um, I came back from the film to do yeah. the TV series. So they're like, well, because she was in the original film that created this TV series, we'll give her a producer credit. So. Yeah, and I was not. That's cool. Uh, luckily, I was not uncast in the TV series. So. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's cool because yeah, it's like, wow, you know what? She went through all that then, and then you were able, like, twenty years later. That's pretty neat. You played the mom. You're playing the mom it just of came full circle. your role. Yeah, yeah. It was weird. It was really weird. <laughs> because then how I did saw you get all... linked up in anime? How did it, how did that get? Was that all around that time when you started auditioning? You got uh, like yeah, anime this... anime voiceover work. They have a studio called AD, ADV Films, and they had a headquarters in Houston. And at the oh time, I, was, I started off in Houston, so they were dubbing a lot of Japanese TV series or, you know, anime <clears throat> TV series, <clears throat> excuse me, um, into English. So that's how I started acting was doing voiceover. So I did about 15 different... I did Street Fighter, and that's the more common ones, Dirty Pair Flash, yeah. um, Bubblegum Crisis, uh, Compiler, Galaxy for Line Yuna, just a lot of, and I just, I would come in, I would just record them, record them, and then I do multiple episodes of each uh, series, so I ended up building a body of work doing voiceovers. Um, wow, 
That's pretty cool. Of all places, Houston, Texas. It's weird, Is right? That, yeah. 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 But I think they also <laughs> they also have studios in Austin so as well. Oh, yeah. Yeah. But, but so, still but Houston, Texas, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Houston is more for theater. And, you know, if you really want to do film and TV, I, I guess they say go to LA or New York. But now with self tapes, you can submit from anywhere. Yeah, pretty much. It's so crazy. Yeah. It was always New York, LA. And then there was like maybe the Vancouver for the, for like the Hallmark movies and, mm-hmm. and the lower uh, production companies that would go up there. But you're right. Anybody can do it. And from anywhere. You know, from, yeah. <clears throat> and once you book it, you just go there and do the job. So self tapes really opened up to where you can audition anywhere. Like I just, I got an agent in Ohio and I'm like, okay, I'm self taping for an, a, a job in Ohio from Texas <laughs> or from yeah. California, wherever. So I can just go <laughs> everywhere. <laughs> yeah, that's pretty cool. More, more uh, over your career, we'll get into like your other acting roles and stuff. But where's like the craziest place that you uh shot did you ever film overseas or anything i was supposed to do a film in hungary and then the strike hit and i think they just put it on hold so that would have been nice to go to hungary i've already been there once before but never to shoot a film so we're still hoping that that you know because right now they're still in the process of ratifying the sag agreement i know yeah if that happens then i can go to hungary and, and shoot but That'd be really. I've cool. always I've always wanted to go back to Vietnam and shoot. That would be yeah. Really that'd be really cool. cool. That'd be a cool like full another another full circle in your life. Like going back there to shoot something. That'd be really neat. Have you been back there to visit? I I did, and I think once going back was I'm good. Um, it's it's rough. When I went yeah. back, it was still. It, I went back in '95, and it's. I think at one point Vietnam was like the 13th poorest country, and now there's so much more um commerce it's it's a lot different than when i went back 20 years ago yeah so it's it's changed a lot i would like to go back now just to to take my niece because she's half vietnamese uh so i would like her to experience it but um yeah if i go back it would be for somebody else because i've already gone back yeah. myself and I've, I've 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 already soaked in uh what i where i grew up yeah no, it's got to be, it's got to be difficult, like going back and then, you know, cause that's where you're, that's where you grew up. So now I understand that, like not wanting to go back, but that'd be cool if you got back there for a, for a film role. Was that movie in Hungary? Was that have to do with full moon at all? Cause I know where you work with full moon a bunch and they film uh, in yeah, like Europe. I, <laughs> no, that was, that one in Hungary was definitely not a full moon. Full moon no, does, wasn't okay. uh, <laughs> full moon does a lot of, uh, horror yeah and sometimes people might say it's it's campy horror but here's the thing i'm a big horror fan i don't know if if you are but yeah yeah. um, i'm a huge horror fan so for me being able to work in a campy horror film is fantastic i mean most people say oh you're in this campy horror film but i'm like no for me that's that's great i mean i would love to have the career that jamie lee curtis has you know she was in prom night the fog, uh, Halloween. I mean, she's terror train. I would love yeah. to have that career. I mean, and I, yeah. I'm just a big horror fan. So I can't be or not. I love them. I love that genre. That's awesome. That's so, that's so cool. You got to work because full moon is one of those companies. Like they pump out a bunch of movies, but they always, uh, people love those movies and they've been around for so long. The reason I mentioned full moon, I know if some of those movies, they still film, just in like a, a studio, just film out in California. But for a little while in like the nineties, any movie that they had like outdoor sets, they need to build, they would go over to not Hungary, but they would go up to Croatia and they had like, a, mm-hmm. they had like an old wild West set that they built in Croatia. Yeah. It's actually or they might still go to there. Shoot with Castle or something, you know? Sometimes oh yeah, they yeah, do, yeah. Yeah. Sometimes they do really neat things. And you know, what was funny was Charles band who owns yep. the full moon uh, mm-hmm. features. He was on a touring show with his puppets. He does like Puppet Master and all the, those uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. those films. So I was living in Houston at the time, and he was touring, selling his puppets and promoting. I think his son is also a singer. Um, I forgot what the the calling. You know that oh, group, really? the calling. So yeah. I think his son 
is the lead singer of The Calling. So his son, I think, came to perform, and then after the performance, he started, you know, he, he, advertising his dolls and his movies and stuff. And I was a huge horror fan, so I went up to, um, I went up, I went up to him when I was in Houston, and I said, you know, when I move to LA, I'm gonna be in one of your films. And he was probably like, yeah, right, whatever, right. <laughs> and then sure enough, a couple of years later, I did two of his films. So, yeah. And it was that's because cool. Was did you bring that up to him? Did Did you bring that up to him? I brought it. I brought it up to the casting director and the director. <laughs> I said, you know, I met your boss in Houston. I told him I was going to be in his movies, and he didn't believe me. And so I I ended up doing Ginger Dead Man Two, Passion mm -hmm. of the Crust, and Ginger Dead Man Three, uh, Saturday Night Cleaver. <laughs> yeah. So. <laughs> They're so silly. Like they're, that, that's what I love about those movies is uh, like any of those eighties, not any of the not the non like Friday the Thirteenth, like those type of slashers. But there's so many like the Gremlins, the Ghoulies, the Critters, and like Puppet Master. It's like so silly, but they're so they're fun to watch. And they have yeah, that, that's all I want to do when I watch a movie. I just want to be entertained. I don't have to watch like a four hour epic movie that yeah. four hours is a long time. At least well, most of those full moon movies are like under 90 minutes. It's like the old. Yeah, they're uh, very, and you know, they shoot them very quick. Like I think yeah. like the two that I shot shot in like a week, but they had, they had, they had two cameras, but they shot in a, a, a week's time and they look, I mean, they're entertaining. I love doing them. I wish I could do more. I really, That's cool. I what was your know, favorite like horror movie growing up? What was like the one that you saw that got you hooked on horror? I, I watched The Exorcist when it came on TV. It came out in the 70s, but I didn't see it until I was uh, on TV. I was 10 years old. I saw The Exorcist. And then uh, my first movie that I saw in theaters was An American Werewolf in London. And I had nice. to take my dad because I was underage. And the first book I read was the Amityville Horror, the book nice. when I was in elementary school. So I started very young um, getting awesome. into to horror. Yeah. I, I, I don't know what it is. It's, it's like a, it's weird. It's like a safe haven for me. <laughs> no, I hear you. When I was a kid, that's right. Like my, I couldn't imagine my daughter who's four, like watching horror real young, but I used to watch it really young. Like I remember watching like Nightmare on Elm Street. It's probably like six or seven. It just was on cable and nobody was home or people were sleeping. And I remember just like, oh, okay. You watched it by yourself? Yeah. I remember not being able to sleep That's for a few scary. days. I was freaked out. Yeah. Because yeah, you don't know. Actually, obviously, you know a movie is a movie, but like it was like such a like deep, like Freddy Krueger was like a monster. Like, you know? So, so let me ask you. You said you were six, right? When you saw it. Uh, yeah, I was like six or seven. Yeah. Okay. So you were home alone. Now, the part mm -hmm. where Tina is home alone, and of course oh. she has to get, right, that didn't occur to you, hey, I'm six years old, I'm home alone, <laughs> ready to come and get me? Like, that didn't Well, I didn't you? sleep, I didn't sleep for like, I remember, if, it was like a, a problem, I remember my parents were really worried about me, because I didn't sleep the first night after I saw it, and then they, and then I had to admit to them that I watched this horror movie, and they were really upset that I did, and then they really like explained to me like, it's not real. It can't happen. And then it made me feel a little bit better, but no, I just remember like this f after, after I, they told me that, uh, it was not real because as a kid, everything seems so real. Like, even though, yeah. you know, it's like a, a, a production, it just doesn't, uh, like sink in when you're watching it. But yeah, it was, uh, it was frightening. But from then on, like I loved horror. Like that's all we did as kids on like sleepovers, like m horror marathons all the time. It's like it's like a invasion of the body snatchers. It's it's Ugh. you got you have to sleep. Yeah. And when you do, you're dead. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no, I I, I I I think you can learn a lot from horror movies. Like there's a lot of things, bad things that can happen to you in real life. And if you go back in your your database, your mental Rolodex of hey. This is a situation that I saw in a horror movie. This is yes. what to not do. So in a way, yeah. I, I, I think they're kind of educational. <laughs> yeah, no, you're right, and that's why I think it was so great about those scream movies that they worked so well. And Wes Craven said, "Let's sort of like not mock the genre, but the way Nev Campbell, 
who was the final girl, like was making fun of it. But then when she was in the situation, 15 minutes later, she ran upstairs instead yeah. of going out the front door, which she was like mocking it. That's so funny. Yeah. I think yeah. of that all the time. Any type of movie, like even action movies. I, if I'm like in New York city and like something, some, somebody, there's like a commotion. I think like, okay, what should I do in this situation? What have I seen before in movies? Right. And you learn how to navigate. Yeah. And it, it, it's, it's weird because, you know, the horror films, they put you in these situations that could happen to you in real life. So if you watch yeah. it, you see how they react in the horror movies. And most of the time they end up dead. So you say, okay, <laughs> I do the opposite and then I'll get to live. <laughs> you know? You're right. Don't hide in the closet. Don't just lay under the bed. Like, just get out of the house. Yeah. For some reason, yeah. they don't do that that's awesome no, that's so cool that you love horror so so when back to your acting so you're doing the uh the fifth ward you're doing the anime and then when was uh when did you end up moving out to la i've been out here now for almost 20 years uh, okay. 17 18 years it's it's been a while it's been a journey because <laughs> <laughs> that's when like right around like i don't know what year officially but like in 2004, 2005, it seems like that's when you were working a lot. Like that was when I moved. Because you were always working. That was when I moved. And it was funny yeah. because I, I had, I'd been toiling away in Houston for about 10 years. And I said, oh, man, I'm not really, you know, I'm, I'm kind of doing the same level work. I'm not jumping up to the next. I got comfortable. And I didn't want to yeah. get comfortable. So I said, that's it. I'm going to move. And I'll tell you... I, the minute I decided to move, I ended up booking like five feature films in Houston. And I'm like, wait a minute. Like, this is like <laughs> a, some kind of evil trick, right? This is like a Murphy's <laughs> Law thing where you finally decide to move and then you move and all the good stuff happens. But I'm going to tell you this story. It, it, please bear with me through this story. But yeah, the no reason worries. I had moved was because I had been in Houston for about 15 years. I, my, my dad had cancer. My mom had cancer. And my grandma, she was, she had a stroke and she was in a wheelchair and I, I took care of my dad. I took care of my mom and I, I promised my mom, I said, I won't move to LA until grandma passes because I didn't want her to have to take care of her mom by herself. And at that point, my dad had already passed away. So I, I made the promise to my mom. It, it ended up my grandma uh, didn't pass away until 10 years later. So I stayed in Houston for 10 years taking care of her. And then when she passed away, I said, this is it. Now it's the time for me. And so um, Halloween, which was getting remade by Rob Zombie, yeah, I yeah. saw the casting on it. And I said, that's it. It's time for me to go because I'm going to go to L.A. and audition for this film. I'm going to be in it. This is the start of my journey. So I, I timed it so I would get to L.A. before they would do the casting for Halloween. Because they said, we're going to cast it in... October, uh, towards the end of the year. So I said, let me pack up my bags. And I, I, I moved out here and I didn't realize how hard it was going to be out here to get cast. And I couldn't even get an agent or a manager. So I was so depressed because no one would represent me. I couldn't get, I just couldn't get my foot in the door. So I said, well, I'm here already. Let's start the journey. And I was, I was very depressed because the reason I had moved during that time was to be in Halloween. And yeah. so um, I, I, went, I went with a friend into Target and I was buying envelopes for my headshots and resumes. Because, you know, back then we still weren't doing digital, we were yeah. doing hard copies. So I, I went into the store, my friend went in, then I went in and I said, you know what? I should always have my headshots with me because you never know who you're going to run into. So I went back to my car, got my headshots. And resumes went into the store and I I swear to you I run into Rob Zombie who <laughs> who was directing Halloween yeah. and I was like I'm, I'm, I'm in a dream right because I couldn't even get an, uh, an agent I couldn't get an audition here I run into the director but I looked horrible so I told my friend go up to Rob and ask him if I can audition for him he was with Sherry Moon Zombie his wife and she was she was pushing a cart and he was walking with her and this was on La Brea and my my friend went up and he said yo he said yo Rob my 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 girl is a huge fan of you and she wants to know if she can audition for Halloween and he was like you know he was like he didn't know what to say because the strange 
black guy just comes up to him and says, let my friend audition. So he gives him my headshot and resume. He folds it into four pieces, puts it in his back pocket. And he says, tell your friend to call Monica Mickelson casting on Monday and tell her that Rob Zombie said she can audition. Wow. And I got to audition. And it was so weird. It just, it, it made me feel like, Man, of all the things that have happened to me in the past, you know, all the mistakes I've made, all the things that I regret, all the turns that I could have taken, the different things I could have done. I said all those things happened exactly the, the way they were meant to happen because it took me to exactly to that point where I was meant to be there. And it made me feel like everything just fell into place and, and it was just meant to be, you know. Wow. So. Of all the – that's insane. The reason you go out there – and yeah. then when you can't get anything, he's at Target. Like Rob Zombie right? at Target. That's insane. Yeah. It's weird, right? And it just made me wow. feel like, you know what? Maybe the maybe I should just have more faith that things come together for a certain reason, a certain time, a certain place. You can't push it. You can't force it. Because Lord knows when I was in Houston for 15 years, I was like, oh, when am I going get, get, to get to go to L.A.? And maybe the timing just wasn't right. Yeah, no. Like you said, everything hap that happened before, maybe if you went a different way on different decisions, that would never have happened. And that, yeah. that's wild. So yeah, well, from George there, Michael made a song about that. Remember really? George Michael? He no, made I know a song George, George... called "Turn a Different Corner." Uh, okay. This it, it, uh, a different corner. If you ever get a chance to listen to that song, it's called. A I'm different gonna. Corner I'm writing it down George now. Michael. And he said it was. A, it's a. It's a love song. And he, he said, turn a different corner and we would have never met. So it's a beautiful song, but it just made me feel like, you know, you know how people always regret and they say, oh man, I wish I had made a different decision. I wish I had done something different or, or went down this path. But no, every decision you made is meant to take you to exactly where you are today. Good yeah, or bad. No, I agree. I 100% agree with that. I met my wife. We went to high school together. We didn't meet until... Uh, she was a year older, so we really didn't talk in high school. But we met six years after high school. And anytime anyone ever says like, "Oh man, don't you wish you went back to that you went to college right after high school?" I'm like, "No, because man, I, I might have never you met, have met your wife. my wife in Atlantic City at two in the morning. Like, happened to bump into her, and then the rest is history." No, I totally agree with that. So like, when it came, kismet. yeah. Oh, I know. No, it's wild. There, there was a story about these two Asian people. Um, they were at a, they were at a structure, uh, this is some kind of monument in, in Asia. And she took a picture and he took a picture, but they were at two different places at the monument. And in her picture, he was in the background taking his picture and they actually never met at that point, but they were at the same place at the same time. And then I think like 10 years later, they met again. And they ended up getting married. And the reason oh. they found out was because they were trying to go back and look at pictures of their relatives and stuff. And she came across the picture and he was in the background of her picture years before. That is awesome. There's a story about that, about a couple that were, were Disney. Like the girl was the husband was like at the in-laws for like the holidays. They were going through Disney photos mm -hmm. and she was like flipping through a book. And he stopped her and he was in the background with his family in a picture at Disney Ooh. at the same time. Yeah. That, that, that means like they were brought together, <laughs> yeah. but it didn't it's happen. Great. So guess what? They're going to bring you together again because yeah. you were meant to be with that person. Yeah. Wow. That's insane. Yeah. Oh man. That's really cool. So from, from that audition, obviously that was probably such a cool moment to have that opportunity. Was it, how did you end up? Cause I know it's hard to get representation and get an agent. how did you end up? doing that like what was how what was your break with doing that i i just sent out postcards and i ended up signing with a, a an agent that specialized in sports so um oddly enough uh the agent that i had represented a lot of athletes and one of the athletes he represented was oj simpson back in oh the day God. yeah that was kind of weird <laughs> yeah. but uh, yeah, he rep represented a lot of athletes. And then eventually, as years pass, time moves on, 
you grow and you get into a bigger agent and a bigger agent and a bigger agent. So, you know, it's I started off with a with a boutique sports agent um, who also represented actors. But then now I've moved on to, you know, a different agency. So I've had different reps throughout the years. I've been here for a long time. Yeah, so. no, I bet you always have to change with depending on what your needs are or what you're looking to have done. But that's pretty cool that you were able to, because some people that's what that, that's what I think is so unique about Hollywood, especially being an actor and actress. Like, uh, it's hard to just get that foot in the door, and that's not even an audition. That's like you're auditioning to get somebody to get you into audition. So it's like you're not even actually getting in front of like the casting directors right away. It's more yeah. of you know, yeah, hey, I need to give so it somebody to put my name out there. Yeah, there, there's so many. Um, the whole process is like a weeding out process. You know, they're trying to weed you out to find the right person. And you have to go yeah. through so many people and so many filters. And there's so many reasons why they don't want to cast you. Oh, her ears are too small. Oh, you know, her nose is too big. And, and yeah. th they're looking for things to weed you out until they get what they consider is the perfect list of people to audition. But they say for every job, there's 2000 people that will submit. So think about that's that. Crazy. I mean, that's, no, and, I know. And they're, they're looking for every reason to, I don't want to say not hire you, but because there's so many actors, it's just so easy to say no because of this and because of that. And that's how you wheedle down the list. Down to yeah. eventually, you know, 2,000 to 200 and then down to 100 or whatever. You know. <laughs> That's why So I'm from rejected. then on, you were, um, oh, yeah, you have to have rejection. You have to get used to that because every no leads to a yes eventually. And you had a lot of yeses. There's so many roles that you did. One that really caught my eye. And obviously, it's like a small part because it's so funny. Like you think of, I know reality shows aren't real. Like the Ozzy Osbourne was the first one that like really like peeled the curtain back because you kind of thought yeah. it was a real show. And then yeah. the last episode, they showed that the lines he, they were, they should, they admitted that it was scripted, but like you were on Gene Simmons family jewels. So that's like a, yeah. you were in that show. Yeah, I, I was in that. I guess I can say a lot of shows are scripted. <laughs> I think all of them are scripted, but yeah, I, I did but it's a, wild I, I to did see Gene that. Simmons. Yeah, and it was very, it was very neat to to work. I mean, I got to meet um, him and his wife and his yeah. kids. It was, it was it was a nice experience. But the funny thing was, even in even on the episode that I did, I was playing a manicurist, and we we weren't even speaking. Were we speaking the same Asian language? I I don't even think we were. <laughs> <laughs> oh, really? You and the other yeah, actresses I don't think in the we were scene. Even, oh. I don't think we were even, she was speaking some, and it was funny because she's, she was actually British and, um, she was speaking, was it Chinese or something? And I was speaking Vietnamese. So it, it was, I think it was that show. It could have been a different show. I don't know. I'm going to yeah. get in trouble for saying that. <laughs> no, I don't know. Right? I just thought that was crazy. Yeah, I yeah, know. But the, just the fact I've never seen that because I've interviewed a bunch of people. I've never seen that come up on like an IMDb. And I was like, wow, I always thought like, okay, we know it's scripted. Maybe they go into the pizza place or the nail salon and say, hey, Gene Simmons is going to be here and his family tomorrow. But I never thought they wouldn't have like the actual people that are in that place. That's wild. Yeah. And, you know, I did a, a show. Well, the reason why I started doing reenactment shows was because in 2008, that's when I did the most reenactment shows. And it was because I see it. There, there was the strike. There was a strike in 2008. And I had actually, oh, yeah. I was supposed to do a pilot, uh, but then the strike hit and they nixed the pilot. And so there was this, they're like, what are we going to shoot? We're on strike. So they had this burst of reality shows. And that's when I just did like a slew of them. Um, and then it just, you know, it, it, the reality shows were, was a way to adapt to the strike. But then when they came, they never left. So now the reality shows are still here. And I did um, Operation Repo. I don't know if you know that one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I, I did that one. And um, when I got back to Texas for the holidays, my cousin said, uh, she said, why didn't you tell us times were so hard that your car got repossessed? We could have helped you. And I was like... <laughs> No, I'm good. I'm good. <laughs> That's crazy. Yeah. So a lot of those shows are, but 
you know, also because I'm a horror fan, I did a lot of true crime reenactment shows. So. Oh, that's cool. I've done so many. I've, I, I've murdered someone. I've been murdered. I've witnessed a murder. I've, <laughs> they're fun. I mean, they're, they're fun to shoot, but based off the fact that they're based off real, sometimes you shoot them and it's, it's fun to do a reenactment. Uh, in general, it's fun to do a reenactment. But if you think about true crime, it's not because this really happened to people. Yeah. You know, and then you're thinking, you know, that, like it's hard to believe that these are real cases. And then it, and then it kind of puts you in a different it, it makes you, it scares you in a way because, yeah. you know, they can't really repeat certain cases on different shows. But, um, so think about it. They have all these cases that never repeat. That lets you know a lot of people are getting murdered and killed and bad things were done to people. And and after a while you do them and you're like, man, it's depressing because th this happened to real people and people are going through this. No, so it's just it's it's weird. It's it's a it's a weird thing to experience. Yeah, and it's like the number one thing right now for podcasts yeah, like Dateline and like uh, My Favorite Murders, like one of the top podcasts. I, I I'm guilty of it. I like I like listening to true crime. I I think it's really I don't know. It's it's uh, it, it's interesting. It's 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 entertaining to watch and. Shooting it is, is really cool and all, but, you know, you stop and you think, man, this happened to real people. Like, if you put yeah. yourself in their shoes, someone had to go through this. I played a woman who was murdered by her husband. He axed <laughs> yeah. her and her mother to death. And I'm sitting here shooting it. And I'm, and then, uh, you know, and then I'm done shooting. I'm like, oh, okay, that was, that was an interesting project to shoot. But then I go home and I Google it. And then you see the real person, you see the real murder, and you're just like, it, it's not, it's, it, you think it's fictional, and then you realize this is all based on stuff that happened to real people, and then you're just kind yeah. of, you know. That's hard. I interviewed a woman that played Casey Anthony on, uh, on a documentary, and uh, like in like the flashback scene, she played her, and she was like really mortified because... There were some things they didn't tell her. Like they found a baby that looked just like Casey Anthony's baby. And she didn't tell people on set. And she was like really freaked out because it looked just like the kid. Oh, that's the real baby. Yeah. It looked just like the real baby. And uh, yeah, no, it's, it's going to be so hard to be in those. Like you said, just Googling it and you see like the picture of the person, you read the details and no, it, it noticed it is terrifying. Like really, and that, it was that happens so often. I, I did. I did one called "Confessions of." I forgot it was called "Confessions of Something." But the girl that I was playing that got murdered by her boyfriend, he buried her in the woods, and they actually found the same shoes that she wore when she got murdered, and they found those exact shoes for me to wear. And I was like, "Man, that's." <sighs> <laughs> You know, it just makes it, it makes you so close to it. It, it, I don't know. Yeah. No, I hear you. Sorry, sorry to definitely... go so dark, but. No, no, it's true. Yeah. <laughs> and 2008, obviously you were doing the a lot of reality, but then that's when you got to work, uh, Ginger Dead Man 2, Passion of the Cross for Full Moon. So that must have been <laughs> cool. Like, the, like you said, you're a huge horror fan. That's really neat that. Yeah. That's, that's really cool. What was your favorite? Obviously, you have a ton of roles. It's not like we go through. I, I, I care when I talk to people. It's more about like the origin story because it is so hard to go from, hey, I want to be on TV to like actually being on TV or film. But do you have a role over the years like that was like most satisfying that you were able to play that you thought like, hey, this is what I'm meant to do? Was there any show or one that you remember? It doesn't have to well, be yeah. like I'm sure there's multiple. My mom wanted, my mom always wanted me to be a doctor. She wanted me to be in the health field. And I was like, oh, that's a lot of work. I mean, that's, <laughs> that's eight more years. That's a lot of school. Yeah. And I was like, ah. but you know what? That's the role I get cast in the most Yeah, is doctors and nurses. And so in a way you got what you wanted, mom. I'm just not <laughs> making doctor pay, but. <laughs> you know. 
<laughs> so That's every amazing. time she every time she used to give me a hard time about how I didn't become a doctor, I just show her a clip of something I did where I'm a doctor, and I'm like, now here you can show this to your friends and be tight yeah. mom proud. <laughs> Yeah, show this to all your friends. It's like a screenshot. It's like, see, that's my daughter being a doctor. Yeah, there you go. The that's end. It. Yeah. <laughs> so, no, yeah, that's no, really I, cool. I, I, there was one project that I did that I was proud of because I had a hand in writing it. It was a, oh, cool. a film um, called Lap Dance, and it was one of one of the few projects that I was in, but I also helped to create the story. So it, it was almost like I got to see it come to life in different ways, not just acting, but um, in a way, getting helping it to get produced creatively. Um, so that yeah. was really fulfilling. Yeah, that's cool. I'm, you know, I'm I saw you had some writing and directing. You'd done like second AD directing. Yeah, and I, that's I, awesome. I didn't last too long because I was I felt like I was so mistreated by the actors. <laughs> Oh. <laughs> because I, I was second AD, so I was in charge of scheduling, you know, the uh, actors. Okay. So sometimes when I would call actors last minute, I, I would say, hey, you got to be on set tomorrow. And they'd get all mad because I'm like, tomorrow. So that didn't last too long. I think I was second AD on two or three features. And I was like, forget it. I just can't take this kind of abuse. <laughs> Everyone the getting mad on at me. The cast on Lap Dance is phenomenal. Yeah. James yeah. Remar, Carmen Electra, Stacey Dash, Muriel Hemingway. Some really big names. It's a, it's a good cast. It was a good cast. And it's funny. Okay, so here's a story for you. Uh, Jake from State Farm. Remember Jake from State Farm? Yeah, yeah, he's, yeah. He's yeah. the African-American actor. Is that Jake yeah. from State Farm? Okay. Yep, that's Jake, so he, yeah. He was in Lap Dance, and I didn't know that. I think he played a really small part. But he wasn't I, Jake I was, yet, I don't think. No, no. He did lap dance first. And oh, okay. then he became Jake from State Farm. And someone had told That's me amazing. that little Oh, I see him. Yeah. Talking. Kevin Kevin Miles. Yeah. And I was like, wow, Jake from State Farm is in. <laughs> but you know, you know who else was in the film? Who else? Ron Jeremy. Ron Jeremy. Oh, but here's the thing. So let me tell you the story about that. We, he, okay. um, he was never meant to be in the film. But what happened was we were shooting at a strip club. And he just happened to be there. As a patron, right? He, just, he was there for not shooting, but to be there at the strip club. So they're like, hey, uh, we get, Ron Jeremy's here. Just, let's just let him do a cameo. And we're like, oh, okay. So then he had a little cameo. <laughs> he had a little cameo while he was getting a lap dance. And it stayed in the movie. But I think in the credits, they ended up deciding not to credit him, maybe. Yeah. Um, because they're like, well, we don't want it to be, you know, we don't want it to be like, you know, this is that type of film. Because it was actual, there was an actual real story. It wasn't about strip yeah. clubs and strippers. It was an actual real story. So we didn't want it to be confused like oh ron jeremy's in it the movie's called lap dance there's got to be this weird yeah there's no porn angle or anything like that but it years later i ran into him at a horror convention which was where i met linda blair uh oh that's awesome from the exorcist i ran into ron jeremy and i took a picture with him and i i i told the director uh was it no i told the yeah i told the director Producer, I said, hey, I ran, it, ran into Ron Jeremy at a horror convention. I think I'm going to post this picture. And the director was like, no, I, I was going to post and say, hey, I did a movie with Ron Jeremy. And I ran into him. <laughs> and my, my, the director was like, no, don't do that. You don't want to say you did a movie with Ron <laughs> Jeremy. <laughs> yeah. But so that's my little Ron Jeremy story. Oh, my but, gosh. Yeah. And he just happened to be there. That's amazing. He was yeah, he just randomly was, on a, on a he Tuesday. Was just, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he just happened to be there. So in a way, he got a little cameo just by being there. So. <laughs> yeah. So are you still write? Do you still write? I do not write at all. No. Although I, I although I did I wrote a I wrote a little mini pocketbook during the pandemic, um, but that was about it. 
it, you know, I had so much time to kill. It was a little therapeutic. Yeah. I just wrote a little a mini pocket book. But other than that, no, I don't write. I, I don't know how to do yeah. three acts. What they say, act one, act two, act three. Not at yeah. all. Yeah. That's cool I, that you I, have that experience of doing that. Even though, like, I know the scheduling, you're doing the scheduling as being second AD. It's cool you see that other side of the curtain. So it gives you, like, that uh, – it gives you – to know more that's because a lot of people just go, they act and that's it. They don't even know what the other jobs are. So that's cool. You have like maybe a better appreciation for that person when they you call you last minute. Yeah, yeah. You appreciate what people behind the camera, you know, once I started doing things behind the camera on crew, I was like, man, you know, this is where the credit go should go to because as an actor, you know, you're just chilling out. Till you're get, getting ready to shoot, and then you shoot during that time. But I really respected crew people because they're at it the whole time. They don't get to take a break. They don't get to from the time they get on set to the time they leave. That's they're on it the whole time. As opposed to you know yeah. you're an actor, you're sitting, you're waiting to do your lines. Of course, you have to memorize your lines, but it, it's not as stressful. But then when the time comes and it's time to do your lines, if you mess up your lines, boy, that's you know, and sometimes I mess up my lines and people say, you got one job. That's all you had to do. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> you got one job. You can't do that. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> but no, oh I, 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 I wanted to know what it was like to be on the other side. And, and I respect crew people tremendously because it's hard. You got to deal with not just your job, but egos and all kinds of things. So I'm glad I did it. I, I yeah. couldn't cut it. I couldn't cut it. <laughs> Sorry, my ego couldn't take it. I was my ego was bruised. It was it, it was it was hard for me to do second AD, but I'm glad yeah, I did. Yeah, I bet. Yeah. Yeah, no, I bet that's gonna be hard. One thing that's on here on uh, I saw it on I don't know if it was like an agency website or something, but you had you had, were in Big Mama's house too in Tropic Thunder, and both those scenes got deleted. Yeah. Well, so. I don't even know if I should say this story, and I probably won't. But okay, you know, <laughs> Big Mama's house, Big Mama's house too, was very traumatic for me. Really? It, uh, yeah, it's uh, even bring, just thinking about it makes me sweat. But I, I, uh. there, there was, there was, I had to do my lines in Vietnamese, and I was confused. That there, there was a physical action. I had to jump off of Martin Lawrence's back, but it was a body double, of course. But I had to jump off. I had to do a bunch of. I had to say lines. I had to do it in Vietnamese, and and I, I got confused. And I think the director was very upset with me. <laughs> so let's just say, uh, and there was a lot of things that happened behind the scenes with. Uh, uh, Martin's crew, Martin's entourage, I guess. I just, you know, I was so green because I had, Yeah. it was my big first feature film. And I, I, there was a lot of things that traumatized me on that set. So. I bet. That sounds like, yeah. to do like a stunt, did you know going in that you're going to have to like do something like that? Or no, was that I, more I, like I think organic? Were, I think they were over budget. And so they were cutting back on a lot of things. So I ended up doing my uh. own stunt. I had to jump off this table which wasn't, it was like maybe five feet off the ground or something. I had to jump off the table onto a, a mat and then run off, say some, say some lines while I was on the table, jump off. So it was just a, a collection of doing the, the physical stuff, doing the lines in Vietnamese, you know, and I, I got confused about when I was supposed to do what, where, what, and then it just, and, you know, everyone was already frustrated. The director was already frustrated, I think, because they said they were over budget. So it just, I, I got yelled at and, and it was very traumatic for me. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. There are so I'll, I'll, there's there's more, but I think I'll just stop there. No, you know, it's okay. No, but no, it's their loss. Time. But no, I've heard stories like that from people, like especially when films are over budget, how quick they want to get things done. And you yeah. to think like a full moon type movie, they shoot that in like, you know, one to two weeks, and it's just like, okay, that's fine. What you know, we get it's like there's like a science to it, but those movies, it's like, okay we have the time and the money to do like the 20, 30 takes. 
So when they don't have that opportunity, that's probably when they get super stressed out. And, you know, it's funny because um, it was the first big budget film that I did that was going out to theaters. So it was that, it was like, oh, my first big film. I have a scene with Martin Lawrence. It was my big, you know, I was like, oh, this is my big break because I was in Houston at the time. But the things that happened to me on that production traumatized me to the point where now when I get cast in a big production, I just, I, I just start sweating. And it was because really? of the experiences that I've had. I, I, and that's why I'm more comfortable in the independent film, guerrilla filmmaking, independent films, is because I'm like, okay, the pressure's off. But when I get yeah. booked in something bigger, like a bigger show or a bigger movie, I, I think back to what happened to me and it, it, it traumatizes me. It's, it's, yeah. yeah. Well, hopefully yeah. you can get past that because you've been on like Watchmen. Is a pretty. Yeah. I'm sure that was a pretty big budget. So well, I've never, I've never had a bad experience again on oh, no, another yeah. big TV show or film. But it was just, but it's always in the back of my head, like, oh my gosh, yeah. am I going to get embarrassed again in front of everybody? Is this going to happen? Am I going to have you know a, a head-on conflict with the hair person? And it was, oh, I, I want to tell you so bad. <laughs> Some of no, the, you don't have but to. But I was like, I don't want to. I yeah, let's not. Dr- you don't have to drum. Mind. Yeah, you don't have to do yeah. that. But I don't no, uh, what, with my story. Yeah, no, totally. One thing I always love asking people, especially now that I know that you're such a big horror fan. So when you were at, like, in your early roles and things you did, did you ever keep mementos along the way? Like, did you keep scripts or like wardrobe? And I was just wondering, like, when you're on like Ginger Dead Man, did you I, keep I, any of I, that you stuff? Know what? Every time I leave a production. I always want, I always ask, oh, can I keep this? Because I love to keep stuff that I wear. So I do Sweet. have clothes that I've worn on productions, but uh, shoes, clothes, sometimes props. I'll keep props from yeah. productions. But the one thing that I always keep are call sheets. So nice. that is my memento. On every single production, no matter how big or small, even if it's like an industrial I'll keep the call sheet. So I have a, a book of call sheets like this high and they're That's just awesome. call sheets from jobs I've done in the past 25 years. And I'll, sometimes I like to flip through them. And it's like, for me, it's like a photo album because I have the names and the contact information of every cast and crew on every <laughs> production I've ever done. And I can flip through it. And it's, for me, it's, it's a, it's a textural photo album, I guess. That's cool. Yeah, so I've kept everything. Even Big Mama's That's house, too. <laughs> yeah. And the call sheet on that was the was this thick. Because it was a big budget. I, I did. I, I kept that. Just so I can... just. It's like you left and you were like, oh, crap, I forgot to get the call sheet. And you're like, oh, I forgot something. <laughs> I, I tell you, I, I, I kept that call sheet. Because you know what? All... All memories, good or bad, are memories. I don't yeah. want to be this person that only keeps good memories. I want to keep all the memories because, like I said, all the things that happen to you happen to you for a reason, and you're exactly where you're supposed to be. So I keep all of them no matter what. Yeah. Now, do you have, like, a dream role that you'd want? Like, if somebody gave you, like, whatever type of role, would it be in horror? Or is there another genre that you'd want to act I, in? I would like the Jamie Lee Curtis roles. Yeah. Yeah. That's, I want to be the Asian Jamie Lee Curtis. Um, except, you know, I've done a lot of horror, but it's all been kind of independent, sometimes campy, but like I said, I love the genre. So for me, that's a treat. Yeah. People make fun of campy horror films, but I'm like, they're great. Are you kidding? You get paid. You, you do what you love to do. The genre is there and you get to see all the special effects, how they do the blood, the makeup, the, um, the horror, it's, it's fun and it, it's weird. So ginger dead, uh, the guy, Michael Deke, I love him to death. He, um, he did the little, I don't know if you've watched ginger dead man, but I've the seen him. Yeah. Doll. So Gary Busey did the voice of, I think he was in the original ginger dead. I wasn't he was, in, part yeah. one, I was in part two and three, but the, the Michael uh, I believe Michael did the little doll, the little ginger doll. And he told me that the teeth in the doll are actually real baby teeth. 
So he got it from, you know how when babies lose their teeth, they grow new teeth? So he kept mm-hmm. the teeth from little babies that were, teeth were growing out, and he used them in the little doll. So the teeth oh, are actually God. real teeth from a baby. <laughs> that is frightening. Yeah. Yeah. That's kind of cool. I, I asked him if I could, I was like, can I have that doll? He's like, oh, we can't because, he said we can't because, you know, Charles, he sells these these props and stuff <laughs> yeah. on his tour, which was like, I wanted that doll so bad. <laughs> yeah, the Puppet Master dolls, yeah. Oh, you wanted well, you know the ginger what? doll. Yeah. I, I went to Burbank uh, the other weekend, and they actually have this display. They had the Evil Dead display, and then they had a bunch of displays. And there's one store, it's like a gift shop. They actually sell a real corpse. It was weird. It was what? a real body. It was rejected. It was, the body was supposed to be donated to science, and it was rejected because there was some kind of deficiency in the ribs or something. I forgot what he told me. So they, they sold it, the, the body of this person, to the gift shop that sells horror stuff. And they have the body there, and you can actually buy it. And I'm like, I don't know if I want to buy a real dead body and skeleton and put it in my Was house. the price, did you see how much it cost? It was a couple thousand dollars. Oh my God, that's insane. I know. <laughs> what do you, what does one do with that? It would just have to be for a, that's, you, I don't even know. What you you, have, I don't even know you if you can legally have, buy that. That's crazy that you can legally buy that. Yeah. But, <laughs> you know, people, people, I mean, people do weird things, you know, they go steal <laughs> bodies from cemeteries. They, they, yeah. Pe- there are people that, Stuff like that doesn't stigma doesn't scare people, certain people, but I couldn't. I know. <laughs> I mean, it's just sometimes even just having ashes is is so close to home. But I can't imagine yeah. buying someone's real body and then putting it in your house. That's that's well, that's why it's still sitting there. Still, yeah, nobody to- wants to buy it. <laughs> Everybody's like, oh, no, no, I'll be back. I'm just going to get my wallet out of my car and then they never come back in. <laughs> That's so crazy that that was an actual thing. But uh, Yeah, you wow. can go see it. It's, it's, it's in a store in Burbank. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that crazy? Like, on she, she goes back home to visit and they see her on Operation Repo and they're like, oh, I didn't know it was going that hard. Because they thought it was real. Because that's what most people would think of. I saw one of my buddies on one of those shows. I would think, oh my God, man. No. Are you okay? Is everything okay with you? Because it seems real. <laughs> Junie was great. I loved her passion for horror. Uh, and I can't wait to discuss next week's sequel that she's in. Ginger Dead Man 3. Saturday Night Cleaver. You can find it everywhere. I know it was on Tubi the last time I checked. Uh, but it was one of those movies that Full Moon has out everywhere. So... You'll be able to find it to uh, enjoy it with us. So again, please like, re- share, subscribe. And our release days are now Fridays. I know this one's coming out on a Saturday. Had a crazy week, but uh, everything is good now. But uh, yeah, so don't forget to review, rate, share our podcast. Follow us on all social media at Sequels Only. And don't forget to check out our website, SequelsOnly.com. Good night. Good night. Good night, guys.